Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. I'm running about 125 volts AC in the lab today, but more importantly, I've made good progress on my DX60 project. In particular, I have a solution for the meter that didn't want to work, and I have managed to fix all of the rotary switches. Let's check it out. Before I give up completely on this meter, there's one more thing I want to try. It's actually a suggestion that came from one of you guys. A viewer had left a comment on my prior video in this series that he recalled seeing an old article, I think it was in 73 Magazine, about an attempt that you can do uh, for sticky meters to see if you can free them up. Apparently it involved a timer circuit with a 555 chip and just put full scale current alternatively on and off, on and off on the meter and see if it'll actually free up and start working correctly. Now I looked, I couldn't find that article in 73 Magazine Archive or on QST's uh, website archive, but it dawned on me it's pretty simple to make a modern equivalent of a simple low frequency timer just using an Arduino. So that's what I did here. I already had this board and display just sitting around from a prior project that I had put on the bookshelf for a while. And all I did was add a simple 2N3904 driver transistor, very commonly done. I'll put a sketch of the circuit on screen. It is very simple. Um, and I just wrote a few lines of code to come on for one second and off for uh, one second. And then also, just for grins to show on the display here, a running uh, counter of how many times it's done it. So my intent here is I'm going to power this on. I'm going to let it run for about 30 minutes or so and see if I get lucky. So let's get it started. There we go. It's on. It's off. It's on, it's off. If it starts working properly, of course, that needle's gonna move up to full scale because this is set for one milliamp. I did check it with my other multimeter to make sure, and it's within a few percent of one milliamp, so definitely right where it should be. It counts up to 10 right now. I don't know if this is coming through on the uh, video or not, but I'm gonna come back in about a half an hour and see if this is so crazy it just might work and <laughs> get my uh, meter working again. Okay, it's been running for almost a half an hour now. The counter is around 940 cycles. So what do you guys think? Do you think that this simple little trick actually worked or did it not work? And wah, wah, it didn't work. Um, I guess I'm not surprised and I really would have been pleasantly surprised if it had fixed this issue. I would have taken it as a victory and moved on. But um, yeah, I'm just going to have to... Uh, Shut it down at this point because clearly if almost a thousand cycles of this didn't make any improvement, you know, running at a hundred thousand isn't going to do anything either. So I'm going to shut it down and just go with one of my plan B's. Finding a drop-in replacement for the meter is my preferred plan B. So after some scouring of the internet, I found and bought this lovely vintage Simpson meter off of eBay. It's still in the original box and sure looks like it's been stashed away in someone's collection since the 60s. However, there is one slight problem with it. I guess in my enthusiasm, I missed checking the physical dimensions. Yeah, I think it might be just a wee bit too large. Let's compare it to the existing meter. Ah, uh, yeah, I might have a problem here. So unless I want to hog out the front panel and displace half the controls, I'm going to need to find another option and save this big boy for a future project. Plan B part two. How about this GE meter? It's another eBay find, it's also one milliamp full scale, and it's pretty much the same size as the existing meter. The body diameter is the same size, which is really important because that needs to fit through the hole in the mounting bracket. The mounting bolts don't align though, it has three of them spaced in a different pattern, but that should be an easy fix. I'd like to put in a custom scale, but it looks like the bezel is crimped to the housing, so removing it to get access to the scale might not be practical. On the upside, it does work, and it works quite well. A quick check shows that it matches my DMM to within a couple percent, and it has an effective resistance of around 57 ohms. That's definitely drop-in compatible with the DX60 circuit. So with my meter problem now solved, time to move on to the next challenge, fixing the rotary switches. Let's take a closer look at the progress I've made here on the function switch. Um, I'll call this portion here the switch deck, and then the rest of this is the mechanical portion, the mechanical assembly with the detents and everything else, the front bushing. And I don't have it put completely back together yet. I don't have the 
screws and washers put in place because I want to illustrate some of the things here I found on the switch deck. Now what I've done here is I've taken this off and I've cleaned it in IPA and then I have lightly gone over the inner rotors here in contacts with a pencil eraser to remove the tarnish and the oxides. And this works pretty well because a pencil eraser is pretty soft and you're not going to abrade it. And you certainly don't want to use sandpaper <laughs> or anything really abrasive because the finishes on these are delicate. It's just a very light plating that's on there. So this gets rid of most of the visible tarnish. And of course, <laughs> there's always the underside, undersides of these contact rings that you can never get to. So you're only really cleaning half the switch, but I guess half is better than nothing. Looking at this schematic, this side of the deck is called FS1. And because I don't have it assembled here, we can pull it off, take a look. This side is called uh, FS2. Now, uh, we can look at the hardware here, the actual switch deck, and notice if we look at the schematic that the Heathkit engineers or graphic artists rather did a really good job of drawing an actually actual easy to understand image that's on there that correlates to the various switch positions as you go around. I think this one starts with position one, position two, three, and so on as you go around. Now there are uh, two poles here on the FS1 side. This one down here in this position uh, connects the key jack when you're in the tune in the AM and CW positions and the other pole is up here these contacts and that's responsible for connecting the screen grid on the 6146 final tube to the cathode of V4 that's the modulator tube and it'll connect it um, uh, to the cathode and AM mode and then you switch over to CW mode and it just puts a DC bias on that 6146 the good news is both of these poles appear to be still functional. There is some arc erosion, especially on the edges of the little rotors as they uh, rotate around and there's some mechanical wear, but it's not that severe. So I think this side of the function switch is still usable. However, the news is not so good on the FS2 side. Let me flip it over here and take a closer look at what's going on here. Now. If you look at that illustration in the schematic, this is actually the mirror image of it because it's almost like an x-ray view. You're, you would view FS2 as if you're looking this way through it, sort of like the bottom copper layer on a circuit board. So this is actually a mirror image to what's in the uh, schematic. But nevertheless, kind of keeping that straight in your mind, there are two poles on this side as well. This one over here controls the AC power to the primary side of the transformer and also to the accessory socket. And the second one over here, these contacts, um, control the high voltage side of the transformer secondary. Now there's still good news here on this pole for the primary side of the AC transformer. I think this is still usable. However, uh, the high voltage section here is destroyed. And that's what I noticed in my prior episode. Um, I'll try to get a zoom in here from a second. Uh, camera in a bit, but if you look at this contact here, it's actually missing a portion of it. It's just eroded or melted away. It's a top spring finger. So it's also got severe arc erosion and mechanical damage on the rotor piece right here as well. Now I've seen online where some folks have been somewhat successful of taking off bad contacts and putting on a salvaged one from another switch and just use a small enough screw and nut to hold it on. I could do that here, but I still would have this problem <laughs> over here with all this erosion. So that's not going to fix the problem. Now fortunately, it seems like that entire switch pole really isn't necessary. Apparently, um, some folks have had the same problem because this switch is notorious for having this problem and they just bypass that circuit and connect the two uh, wires on the secondary high voltage side together. And so anytime you've got the radio on, you've got the high voltage uh, secondary on. And from what I can tell, that doesn't seem to be a problem. And furthermore, if you look at other radios that I've worked on on my channel in the past, like my Drake TR3 and my Heathkit HW101, they leave the high voltage on the final two uh, plates uh, all the time. Anyway, so whenever you got the rig on, you got high voltage there. So I don't think that's gonna be an issue. And that certainly is a, is a simple fix. Because what I will need to do is I got to remove this portion of the, the rotor because it's pretty bent and all that uh, erosion that's on here tends to make it bind on this contact. So I just got to remove that and then, like I say, connect the high voltage wires together. And then I think I'm in business. I think I can salvage this function switch and put it back in the rig. 
I also need to do some maintenance on the crystal select switch. Normally this is assembled at the end of a long tuning shaft, but here I've just attached one of the knobs to it. The contacts are dirty, but otherwise appear to be okay. The big problem though, is the shaft is binding in the bushing and it barely turns. That's a common problem with these old switches. There's various ways to fix them, and the method I like to try first is to use some penetrating oil. It works best if you can soak the mechanical assembly in it for a few hours, so that means removing the switch deck, which is easy enough to do. Sometimes this happens when the shaft galls into the bushing, but most of the time it's just the oils in the grease that have evaporated over time and left the clay fillers behind. I need to give the penetrating oil some time to work. So I put the mechanism in a small container with a generous spritz of the oil. Most of these penetrating oils contain light volatiles that evaporate easily, so covering it up while it soaks is a good idea. That did the trick. It rotates very smoothly now. I did also put a bit of grease on the detents and a drop of machine oil between the shaft and the bushing. Along with a light cleaning of the contact surfaces, this crystal select switch is ready to rock and roll again. I also used these same techniques on the band switch, and it too is all good now. And as I said earlier, I can work around the bad contacts on the function switch. So it looks like I've got all three rotary switches on this DX60 ready to return to service. I've also made good progress on a lot of the other mechanical problems on this project, and I've ordered all of the replacement parts that I think I'm going to need to fully restore it. So that'll be the subject for the next episode. And as always, I thank you guys for watching my channel and do hope you're enjoying this material. So until next time, bye for now.